will be here some days uh, doing that. But uh, our uh, panelists here today represent uh, three of the major jurisdictions in life. But with regards to the status of the regulation, I, I would say that uh, Latin America is not different. It was Europe some years ago. We have white markets, we have grey markets, we have black markets. Uh, starting by this last one, black markets would be Brazil at the moment, which is about to liberalize gambling always. <laughs> uh, we talk about white market, like we said, that it's Colombia with full regulation for land based as well as for online at the moment. That uh, kind of uh, classification, I would say that Mexico is also there with a traditional land based regulation and with some provisions right now that allow uh, to do. Uh, Online and if I should mention some very market, no, no presence here today, it should be Peru, where the regulator says that, that uh, online market, uh, uh, online companies taking Peruvian residents without a license because it's not expressly regulated, it's not expressly prohibited. Maybe one day they are working now in a draft, the regulation uh, will be approved, and then we need to have a license ever at the moment. Any operator that is uh, launching or taking residents in Peru without a license uh, will have no uh, any kind of uh, prosecution or enforcement or so. Uh, one of the common aspects, in order to kick off the final, uh, one of the common aspects in, in Latin America is that perhaps the time it takes, and I was mentioning this now in Brazil, uh, in order to uh, regulate and liberalize the case of Brazil. In that uh, sense, uh, well, uh, since 2012, 2011, I guess I have been hearing that Brazil is about to uh, liberalize on again. I would like you, uh, Neil, to tell us what you think uh, that is taking so long and to implement all these regulatory changes. Well, uh, there has been a general ban on gambling in Brazil now for nearly 18 years, so since the 1940s. Uh, more recently, since especially 2014, with, uh, because we have two uh, bills of law uh, currently underway at Congress, trying to liberalize and to legalize gaming. One which started in 1991 by the House of Representatives, and another one in 2014 by the Senate. So, in the last uh, three, four years, there has been more discussion, and at one stage last year, uh, we were really seeing uh, light at the end of the tunnel. Apparently things were fast-tracking and there was light. Um, however, everything came to a complete standstill. And this year, unfortunately, is an election year in Brazil. We have presidential elections now next month of October. And so, in an election year, nothing happens in Congress. So, probably, uh, we won't have any news uh, this year. Hopefully, next year, 2019, depending on who uh, gets to the presidency uh, that will have a big influence on what will happen with uh, the legalization of gaming in Brazil altogether. At the moment, the candidate who is winning the polls is a candidate called Jair Bolsonaro. Uh, he is a former uh, member of the military and is very close to um, the, uh, religious groups, and so potentially uh, he doesn't look at uh, gambling uh, so favorably. Uh, so if he wins, uh, maybe uh, we'll still see many years to come before anything happens uh, with the legalization of gambling. But you have to remember that Brazil is the world, still the world's largest Catholic country. So I think uh, gambling in Brazil has always uh, been hand in hand with morality and religion, uh, and also organized crime. Because um, one product which is very peculiar to Brazil, which is very black market, is the Jogo do Bicho, mm -hmm. animal game, which is translates. And uh, that has been going on for decades as well. And maybe those who run these types of games don't want to see uh, gambling legalized because they could be out of business. But the reason uh, for all these delays are a mixture of um, legislative slowness, morality, religion, and organized crime. Thank you, uh, Francisco. I remember a few years ago, uh, Mexico was discussing about a new gaming act or a reform of the previous gaming act that comes from 1940 something. Uh, that draft was approved in the Congress, however, uh, it got stuck in the Senate. Uh, 
Is, is it always like this on the long run? Well, yes. Uh, and actually, this is my second uh, intervention in an INGO conference. And I remember back, back in my first uh, intervention was in Lima. And everybody that I have seen has told me, I remember you were so happy and you were so excited because you were about to have a new gambling law, which was a uh, breaking uh, stage uh, uh, in, the, in gambling legislation. Uh, it was very, very well drafted, and it had many, many topics that are now uh, central to to gambling, uh, mainly online gambling, uh, because the law, which is from 1947. Uh, does not contemplate uh, online gambling per se. It is not until the regulations of 2004 that uh, there's uh, this special concept uh, on how to regulate online gambling. So, uh, uh, online gambling is legal in Mexico. Let me clarify that. Uh, but we're still uh, uh, with a uh, staff Congress. And now that we are changing uh, the government, uh, you know, uh, a new president uh, will be in office as of uh, December 1st this year. And uh, we don't expect to see many much changes in the next uh, months, but uh, after next year, we hope it gets past this time. Thank you, Francisco. The case of Colombia is correct if I'm wrong. What kind of, uh, they have, uh, you have a new regulation. For all again, the first one in the region since three years ago. Uh, some amendments are proposed that they have been cited in the public consultation uh, regarding the uh, introduction of international liquidity, regarding the introduction of new games modality, even our little class, the class, in order to uh, amend the current uh, order, and uh, this will allow class which are specific for all again be approved and that will bring the operators to the region. Why do you think uh, that these drafts are stuck since more than one year already and they are not approved, uh, taking into account that they will help to, to, to raise the number of operators to your jurisdiction? Okay, um, first, uh, a comment about our structure. If you, uh, if you, if you uh, as you know very well, the structure of the regulation in Colombia, our model is a very interesting model that you think it will be very efficient as we have a legal framework from 2001 which regulates uh, the gaming industry and gave a lot of autonomy to the regulator to create and develop the industry. So it's, it, you think that it's a, a very efficient structure as in fact the regulator works like a corporation. They, they have a president, they have a directors and staff, so you will see like this is a very efficient uh, uh, model. The problem, of course, is, uh, and we, we, we felt that when the first draft of the online regulation was for public comments, local, local uh, operators were like trying to fight uh, against that development, of course. Now, the land base were making a lot of opposition for the land uh, regulation. Then we have the land regulation in force. Now we have a regulator that wants to develop the industry as fast as, as a tech business. They need this uh, development very fast as the technology is going even faster. But the operators that are uh, with a, a, an actual license, of course, they are kind of trying to, to fight the development because they connect these new games and uh, international liquidity with big operators. So that's a fact. I mean, uh, probably Victor can argue some of that as if it's a local operator, but that's that's a fact. So I think there's a, the associations create a political uh, force to to slow down that process. So the act the local operator that already has a license could sell their business and be a little more comfortable, pro probably prepared. Thank you, Juan. And, and thank you again, Victor, for being here today. Uh -huh. uh, and particularly for sure. wanting to join the table of four lawyers. Yeah, that's very uh, exclusive. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, it's really 
was serving, I said, no bravery, you're not used to presenting uh, surrounded by lawyers, but I, in this case, I guess uh, Santiago represents our interest in Spain, so to a degree I feel a bit more comfortable. And I will not track your work exactly. <laughs> I appreciate that, so, so. Yes, my, my question to you is, uh, what, uh, since the operator perspective, uh, how do you assume uh, all these delays all these, uh, these jurisdictions are always about to regulate uh, yes. on and get in or, and, say that, and the delay in one more year, five years, suddenly in seven years. Yeah. I, I think the panelists here have done a good job of sort of getting out the feel of the Latin American region. I've been operating there since 2016 um, with that dot com business at first, as, as Antero mentioned, with being a party. And uh, it's been five years since I started working with uh, Gaming One. And Gaming One, different from these uh, other operators in the region, has a very specific locally regulated business. So that means that in the case of Latin America, we can only look at certain specific markets, including, of course, the case of Colombia. Um, we looked at Mexico, of course, for, for a time, but as Francisco very well says, it's not a solid regulatory framework. That's also the case in Argentina, uh, where I had to shut down Bidding.com.ar, which was a licensed operation there. So the, the case of Latin America as a whole is not that it's, it doesn't exist or that the regulation doesn't exist. It's rather how that regulation uh, is enforceable and how uh, convenient it is for operators to have it. And obviously, in, in most cases, we've seen this already in the US and uh, in Europe, you can sort of imagine how difficult it is for regulators to enforce regulation. Um, I think that the case of Peru, for instance, if you look at the spectrum of potential regulation, the case of Peru is that um, San Roman, the, the, the uh, engineer San Roman, he's been in the, uh, in the office for about 15 years. He's been wanting to regulate for about five years. He always comes to his conferences and says, we're, we're very close, we have the framework, it's going to go to Congress. But in the meantime, he knows most operators are, to, to one degree, I would say, legally operating there, just simply not paying any taxes and not paying any, any licenses. So in that, in that case, the, uh, the Colombian regulatory framework is uh, probably the strongest and, and most interesting case. I do wish, however, as an operator that only operating those, those type of markets, uh, that this is a trend for the rest of the region. It would be very interesting mining uh, opinion if, if Mexico finally ends up um, developing that new framework, or if Peru, for instance, is, is uh, capable of uh, of enforcing that, that new framework that uh, Mr. San Roman is working on. So, um, but I, I, it does seem as if we're always a, a few months away from being a few months away, which is certainly a uh, certainty. Thank you. Uh, we are witnessing now, uh, particularly in the US, uh, New jurisdictions that are regulated on Agape are uh, requested uh, previous bricks and mortar, which is a land based casino uh, license prior uh, before, uh, obtained before in order to be granted with an online license. Uh, I would like to know what's your point of view on this matter, and particularly in your case, Francisco, where uh, you know it is not clear if you need that previous license in Mexico or you don't need it. Uh, you was a little bit of light. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, this is uh, the greatest confusion about uh, why uh, most foreign operators believe that there is no such thing as legal online gambling in Mexico. And that is because uh, our framework uh, is, our legal framework is based in uh, what is called land based casinos. And it's mostly dedicated to the operation of land based casinos. And as I was talking uh, yesterday with uh, some colleagues, uh, I was mentioning that uh, the regulation for online gambling is hidden uh, in a concept named Remote Betting Center with uh, raising of bets via internet. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the situation is that in the regulations for gambling, uh, it's contemplated along with uh, the whole of realms of numbers which is the legal name that we give to casinos, land-based casinos. And uh, most, uh, most uh, online gambling licenses
license in Mexico for now has been requested by pre-existing uh, land-based operators in Mexico, which now uh, are using the new technologies to uh, open and operate their uh, online gambling business. And since there is no such thing as a foreign operator requesting for license to operate legally in Mexico, uh, it is the intent to believe that uh, it is illegal to have online gambling. But that is not true. It's just a mere confusion, uh, which results from our confusing legal framework. Uh, but uh, I, I think that uh, the main point here is that it is not necessary to have an, a land-based casino in order to request for an online license. Okay, thank you. Uh, Neil. In the case of Brazil, obviously, that, that requirement does not exist as there is no uh, any kind of legalization. The question, your view of this concrete requirement that must be a barrier for the uh, online companies, bureau online companies without any kind of business in the land based sector. Yeah. Is there, first of all, is there any, are there any comments in Brazil in relation to this potential, of course, not previous request because there is nothing, but the fact that you need to have some kind of land based operation in order to operate online in the future. Is there anything like that in person? What should be on that? Well, originally in the bills of law, there was a requirement to have land based first, be able to get a license for online. Uh, but the bills of law changed over time and they can still change as well. So we have to know what will happen. For so many years. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, but at the moment, uh, there wouldn't be any requirement to first have a brick and mortar land based uh, operation to have an online. And there are rumors at the moment that while there was uh, an attempt to, to produce a law that legalized gambling altogether. Uh, if that still going to take too long, there are rumors that the government may focus on online mm -hmm. gaming and betting. So I'm potentially not require any land-based situation for that. Thank you. What well, uh, was your view on this? Well, in Colombia, it's separate license. You can uh, request a license for a land base, or you can request an online. In fact, there is like this. Uh, uh, marriage between online and um, land-based uh, <coughs> regarding that the online regulation uh, permits for the online operators to uh, start like uh, put to work uh, terminals for betting, sports betting with certain limitations and one of the places where you can put that is on land-based. Mm -hmm. So you see uh, a very well, uh, you, you already see that is happening how, how the industry is uh, having this relationship between online and land based, uh, but you don't need uh, a license uh, each other, so it's just like a commercial contract that they're like, creating. Thank you. Uh, Victor, uh, how is this kind of barriers seen by, a, by an operator, and what other barriers factor that the previous requirement on, of uh, previous bricks and mortar? Uh, what part, in addition to that, what other requirements might one operator to leave a market, not enter into it? Well, so, probably gaming one in this sense is a bit of an anomaly compared to the rest of the online operators. We are ourselves land based operators in Belgium. We operate two casinos and 27 slot vaults. We own four casinos in France. So, before we were online operators, we were land based operators ourselves. So our model was always to try and bring in that convergence aspect from land-based to the online and all of our operations right now in 10 jurisdictions reflect that. We go in looking for a land-based partner who sort of understands the market, we bring in our own technology and then we sort of create that marriage, hopefully long term, uh, for, uh, for, for that particular market. So in the case of game one, um, Technical difficulties or certification difficulties are actually a, a, an interesting obstacle. That means that we are trying to avoid that grey market operators, uh, dot com operators, are, have a, an easy way into a market that should be protected. That's because we believe that land based operators have probably done a significant amount of investment over time to get that uh, position in the market. So obviously, uh, we've seen it in. In the case of Belgium, certainly, 
that uh, online will lead liquidity of land based operators if they're not properly protected, if there's not no convergence aspect to it. Um, the case of Colombia, we did uh, find a group, uh, Bika group, uh, they became our partners, they have the senior citizen, the senior citizen in, in Colombia, so to us it was mostly out of a, a philosophy to try to find that partner. I do understand that it's probably not the case for many markets, obviously not the case for Brazil once it regulates because of the lack of existence of any framework and operators. Um, but that's also the case with Peru, for instance, right? In Peru, you have a wide array of operators, class A, class B, and even class C. And if you were to regulate that market and try to protect it through uh, land-based exclusive, uh, exclusive access to the online, uh, that would probably mean that you're leaving out most of the existing operators that are not illegally operating. So I would say that in the case of Latin America, you have to go on a case-by-case -case basis. It's really, I, I know it's, this is very boring for the audience because it's also what you're hearing in the States. Every state must regulate according to their own uh, requirements. But it certainly is the case in Latin America, right? There's no uni universal or uniform uh, regulatory framework there. Thank you, Victor. Uh, Neil, does this uh, never-ending siesta in Brazil or this status quo uh, in leading players of, of creating a, an illegal market in the region? Yeah, yes, we do have a, a very clear black market, which is the juridical issue that I mentioned. We also have lots of um, clandestine casinos as well. Uh, and those are the places that the police uh, from time to time raids as well and, uh, <laughs> and arrest people uh, but again these are just uh, criminal contraventions uh, so they're misdemeanors they only um, have imprisonment of three months to one year and normally nobody goes to jail for that uh, however we do have a great area uh, of three, three different areas one of them are the offshore uh, online providers access in the Brazilian market is still very controversial whether that will be illegal or not. Uh, I believe um, that based on the legislation we have today uh, that it would be illegal even if it's online and in the days when uh, the legislation was enacted of course back in the 1940s there was no internet uh, but the, the legislation is sufficiently broad to encompass uh, the internet uh, within the legislation. In a few years ago as well uh, the law was changed to expressly uh, contemplate that players caught playing online also commit a criminal con contravention. Uh, in terms of uh, another gray area, we do have uh, a state in Brazil called Rio Grande do Sul, in the south of Brazil, uh, which argues that um, the criminal contraventions law was not encompassed by the federal constitution of 1988. So at the moment, there is a, a case before the Supreme Court where the state of Rio Grande do Sul is challenging uh, the existing legislation. And, and depending on what the result is, that will be binding on all courts in Brazil. So it's very interesting to see what happens there. And then, third, uh, and this we have seen in Sao Paulo, there have been a number of charitable bingos, where people rent out spaces uh, for uh, charitable bingos, uh, using a loophole in the legislation. So those are the current three great areas at the moment. Uh, and. Uh, what we are seeing is that potentially the legislation exists, especially in the DML area, uh, for payment uh, processors uh, to, to really um, be, be prosecuted. It's very difficult to see in Brazil the players uh, being arrested. It's very, very difficult. But there's a greater risk. Uh, yeah, very difficult to see players being arrested. Uh, the authorities uh, really have not gone uh, to enforce the legislation. But there is more and more, especially from the credit card companies, we have seen uh, credit card companies block suspicious transactions. So uh, in practice, it's more on the financial side of things that there may be more enforcement than actual prison time or criminal prosecution. Thank you. Juan, uh, how is this matter being addressed uh, uh, by the Colombian regulator? If there's any kind of legality, and, and you know, what's the enforcement there? Okay. Well. Uh, the first thing I would say, in Colombia there is a, not anymore a grey market, it's just black market. I mean, the, 
position now for, for the regulator regarding uh, online gaming is everybody that has not a uh, license, it's illegal, and everybody will go to them, you know, after them. So we have basically two consequences. There is a panel uh, criminal uh, consequences. So there is a, um, the, the regulator has uh, this ha has this contract where, where there is a company which is like on, uh, continuously looking for digital proofs um, to start like a, a criminal process against. Uh, even if they are not located in Colombia, they will have this process when they decide to arrive to Colombia legally. So they will have problems. So. That's, that's kind of the, the attitude, the attitude like right now of the regulator. Uh, they have very, very, very uh, active um, uh, relationship with the police, as the regulator by law has some uh, police attributions regarding gaming, so they can go uh, and uh, chase uh, illegal markets and illegal casinos and small betting. Places. So it's, it's, I, I would say it's very, very active and online, regarding online, now it's getting more active mm -hmm. and, and going after that. So after that siesta period, they have yeah. uh, reacted now and yeah. they are prosecuting and the criminal consequences yeah. to operators that don't have a license. Yeah, they, 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 they in fact, uh, I mean, I had a meeting uh, a week ago in Colombia with a regulator and Basically, uh, we saw how they are like creating these files to start criminal process against some uh, online operator that hasn't shut down voluntary their dot com sites. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Francisco. Uh, how is the illegal market or the black market in Mexico, if any? <laughs> and how the regulator is addressing that market? Um, well, uh, we are mostly uh, grey market. And there is no such thing as uh, black market or enforcement against uh, online operators, uh, at least uh, not in fact. We haven't uh, seen the Mexican government act as, uh, as uh, strong uh, against uh, illegal operators as Colombia did, for example. Uh, and mostly prosecution is focused against uh, illegal and based operators. And, and is there any criminal code applicable? Is the criminal code is just administrative sanctions, or um, what would be the consequences of carrying out uh, an illegal activity? It, it is it is not included in the, in the criminal code. It's included in the federal law list of games and crimes. Uh, it is uh, typified as a crime to conduct illegal gambling uh, activities without uh, the authorization. From the regulator, which is the Ministry of the Interior or SECA, mm -hmm. and any gambling activity carried out against uh, the federal law or its regulations without the authorization from the regulator is considered to be a crime. It's uh, prosecutable with three to six years imprisonment. But uh, as I was telling you, the, the enforcement is more focused on illegal and based than online. Thank you, uh, Victor. To what extent? Uh, it is important that uh, the regulator effectively battles against illegal gambling for an operator. Well, I, at the time, yeah, the, I mean, not only at the time of entering the jurisdiction, but also at the time of perhaps leaving the jurisdiction after being licensed. Well, well to us, it's uh, of the odds, it no significance because we are looking at um, the values. Let's say, in the case of Colombia, uh, for instance, you need to. Uh, have a significant amount of development on your back end uh, to uh, be able to enter the market in the first place, right? So, giving one, for instance, uh, was the third uh, licensee in that market. Right now, we're looking at 12, 13, I think. So, 12, 12 already, and the regulation has been there already for two years, right? So, it wasn't easy to, to get there in the first place. It took us probably six months to be able to solve our backend issue and our technology is relatively new compared to, to our competitors. So uh, you're looking at a significant investment from a development perspective. Uh, in the case of Colombia, you also have a license fee, which is a yearly. Uh, so it's also a significant uh, pecuniary uh, of an obstacle to, to move into that market. Um, so if I were to look at a market like for instance, Mexico, which is a very large <coughs> market, of course, but just by sheer size of it, and I know that operators are not paying taxes locally because they are located in Malta or somewhere else. 
had nothing with Malta and Britain. We had an, an operation in Malta as well. Uh, but um, if they're abroad and they're not paying any taxes, that they're not subject to any marketing uh, restrictions or any anti-money laundering uh, measures, particularly of that country, then that's certainly a no-no for our company. But I can certainly see the value there for, let's say, more flexible operators. Thank you. Talking about marketing and actions, and, and what it's allowed in, in your respective jurisdictions to do uh, uh, in terms of advertising and promotion. What can you want to Well, we have uh, our our standard gaming law. The status is that if you are a game of chance operator, basically you are free to do advertising and uh, promotions without requesting any specific license. So. If you are not a game of chance operator, you need to do some uh, request to, to, to do um, promotion and stuff like that. But, but if you are um, an operator, you, you are kind of free of uh, certain limits about legal age. And, but, but there is no specific restrictions right now. I mean, we are expected, of course, with the online uh, business going on, we are we're expected to have a new <coughs> development on that matter. But there is no expertise now in Colombia about that. So just now you can see one uh, soccer team, football team, with with, uh, with advertising of, uh, of betting online. A couple of uh, places where you will find uh, advertising, but there's the issue is not there now. So I would say it's great. Does it mean, for instance, that? Uh, of course, it's not going to happen. But would it be possible that uh, a sports betting portal makes an advertisement on TV with Mickey Mouse? No, I mean certain restrictions, normal restrictions about legal age, like like alcohol, betting, and uh, and uh, cigarettes should not be promoted between okay. until 10 a.m. in the morning and after. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's like the general rule, but there's no specific restriction except like not have a casino nearby a school. Or, I mean, yeah, but that's, that's it, so. Francisco, what about Mexico? Oh, well, Mexico, uh, advertising for gambling activities is uh, restricted only for licenses. Uh, so in, if you want to advertise gambling activities in Mexico, you need to own uh, a license by the Ministry of the Interior, and also there are some uh, specific guidelines in the regulations or the gambling regulations, uh, such as uh, the age, uh, and they have to have the legend stating that uh, games of chance are to be used only for entertainment and leisure purposes exclusively. Um, and of course, there is also the need to request for the approval of the Listed before the Ministry of the Interior, uh, so they can broadcast uh, any charges. Of course, uh, this publicity is uh, limited, for example, let's say uh, Open TV, uh, because, uh, like we know, uh, we have no control over what we can advertise on the internet. So, uh, overall rules uh, is that only uh, license holders may advertise gambling. Thank you. Uh, Neil, I imagine that this is not a big question in Brazil right now. Well, in, yeah, in Brazil, since currently um, all unauthorized gaming is illegal, uh, you can only publicize what is legal. So our main body of law uh, regarding advertising is the Consumer Protection Code. Uh, one of the main uh, principles is that advertising cannot be abusive. And one of the forms as well of being abusive is when you promote illegal activities. So there has been a case several years ago involving sporting events where uh, the watchdog, the, the advertising watchdog called CONAR, C O N A R, uh, was successful in going to court and taking off air uh, an advertising campaign which involved, I believe it was signage in the stadium and also on TV and uh, online as well. And it was the only case I believe that has been tested and so far. And this is one of those gray areas, right, where the, you have the offshore online operators into Brazil, where the Brazilian court said that no uh, advertising would not be allowed because of the legality of gaming and betting altogether here in Brazil. If one day, in 
pain and medicine does become legal, then uh, Conar, for example, would have to change its code of conduct as well to allow for advertising. Uh, and is there potentially, just as the case of Colombia as well, uh, restrictions would be put in place uh, to safeguard uh, children, for example. The same uh, happens in Brazil with alcohol and cigarettes as well. Um, potentially, it will also advertise in responsible gambling as well. Thank you. Victor, uh, as an operator, are you in favor of the car launch? This is making uh, advertising in uh, Mickey Mouse. So, what do you think that certain restrictions will apply? Well, I think, yeah, certain restrictions must apply, obviously. Uh, we do have to, in the case of Colombia, we do have to uh, keep a, a certain profile regarding uh, AML and uh, protect that uh, problem gambling, so it, that should translate to uh, advertising as well. Uh, my addition would be that this needs to be enforced more heavily by uh, regulators, obviously. And I think that the best way to do that is to hold, hold accountable uh, the media channels. I think they're responsible for content as well. So obviously they should be prosecuted if they are, let's say, taking money from illegal operators. And that is currently going on even with major networks, right? We're seeing it as regional advertising since at least 2004, where major, uh, let's say, sports networks uh, have received money from international operators and they are pretty much uh, competing with what I had to pay locally uh, in the, the, well, the case of Colombia but also in markets where like Brazil, right? I think the investment in Brazil is one of the probably comparable only to, to some markets in Europe or Sweden perhaps. It is probably a significant that there's a, there's a huge amount of money coming into that market through the uh, means of regional advertising. Thank you. Uh, we're short of time. Uh, we have one minute each. One minute each, but if possible, to tell our audience what are the next thing that is going to happen in your respective markets in the next four months, let's say, in the near future. If, if anything happens. If anything happens, let's hope that uh, the new law that we have stuck in the Congress will get passed. Although I, I'm not so sure about it anymore. As I said, I was pretty excited about being it uh, approved uh, four years ago, but we're still waiting for it. So uh, let's uh, let's hope that the, ne the new government uh, takes uh, into consideration the new the new act. Thank you. Neil, is it going to happen in Brazil or not? Well, this all depends on elections, as I said before. So in terms of what's the potential election? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what happens in 2019. The only concrete thing in Brazil is that the, the government, the federal government, is going to try and sell off again the Lotex, the Scratch Instant Lottery. Uh, there were no bids earlier this year uh, for the prioritization of Lotex, but maybe now in the last quarter they're going to put it up for sale as well. Again, maybe this time there will be some. Brazilians are always optimists. <laughs> One. Well, in the case of Colombia, um, I think we expect to have uh, some wheels moving sooner. We have we have a, a draft uh, regulation that amend the actual regulation since more than one year, uh, which permits new games, casino, scratch, uh, live casino, uh, integrate virtual sports, <coughs> which is now I mean it's been legal since two thousand. Uh, 12 something, uh, but nobody has applied for that license, so they are integrated virtual sports betting into the online game regulation. Uh, international liquidity, but as, uh, as I said, the, there is a lot of uh, resistance from actual operators because they connect uh, international liquidity, for instance, with big operators, even though that there is no one license that is uh, uh, using poker. Again, so I think that's what we have in the scope. Uh, I think, uh, and we expect that things are going to start moving. As uh, we saw the last uh, report of Colpuegos, where the first semester of 2018 uh, there was uh, 54 million US dollars on betting uh, between the 12 uh, well, actual operators, uh, with uh, something like 44, 45 million of prices. Uh, so. Uh, of uh, 12 million around. So I think the regulator sees that there is a profitable business. So 
I hope it's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> Victor, what's the most expected uh, regulatory change in the region for uh, anyone? For me, well, if I were to bet, I would say that Concavity is right. We'll probably see the addition of new content in, in Colombia, which I would appreciate for sure. Um, I would say that my, my hope is that Peru and eventually Chile would regulate. I have, sorry guys, I've lost a big hope in, in Mexico and <laughs> Brazil, uh, at least for the next five years. So that, if you ask about my opinion, I would hope that Brazil is the first, but I, I don't see that happening. Okay, uh, well, please help me to thank you uh, for our panelists today, and uh, thank you very much for your attendance.